Hi, this is Dr. Kate Crowley. This is module four of our course, Ethical Practice Through Evidence-Based and Culturally Responsive Disability Evaluations. Clinicians, supervisors, administrators, and researchers as agents of change. In this module four, we're going to look at the SLP change makers who are lead SLPs, researchers, and SLP directors. We'll hear from Dang Farmakan, Dr. Giselle Nunez, and Tara Bailey. Hi, I'm Dang Farmakan, lead speech language pathologist for West Contra Costa Unified School District. I've been working in this district for 21 years, and I've been the department chair or lead SLP for 13 years. Let me tell you a little bit about my district. West Contra Costa Unified is a school district in Costa Contra Costa County, located on the eastern side of the San Francisco Bay in Northern California. West Contra Costa Unified covers several cities from Kensington to Hercules. We have 34 elementary schools, one of which is a Mandarin immersion program, five K-8 schools, six middle schools, seven high schools, and one alternative school. We also have one charter school. In 2020-2021 school year, the district had 31,027 enrolled students. 28.8% of these students were designated English language learner students, who I will be referring to as ELL students or ELLs. Here's the table that shows the different languages that are spoken in our district. You will see here that um, we have Punjabi, Tagalog, Portuguese, Arabic, all other languages, and Spanish that are spoken by our ELL students. And you will see too that majority of our students speak Spanish. Now let's take a look at our students' ethnicities. You will find that we have the majority again as 54% um, are Latino and we have African-American, Asian, white, Filipino, and multiracial. The district is highly diverse as you can see, and Spanish is the language that's used by most of our ELL students. Now what's happening in special education? Upon review of our most recent special education data, I found out that there are, to there are a total of 4,462 students in special education. 899 of these ELL students have the disability category speech and language disorder or impairment. This information has serious ramifications in our practice. 15 out of our, of, out of our 38 SLPs are bilingual and the rest are monolingual. The majority of our students speak Spanish, but we only have two Spanish speaking SLPs. Our caseloads are becoming more and more diverse, but our department cannot keep up. Consistent with the study of Caesar and Kohler in 2007, our SLPs face tremendous challenges in assessing English language learners. Here are just more um, common concerns that my colleagues have expressed to me. What test do I use to evaluate an EL student who tested beginning on the English language proficiency assessment? Can I use CASEL or SELF? Five, if you ask and I use the norms, I don't know how to test this child. I don't speak Spanish. Is there a Spanish speaking SLP who can do this assessment? Evaluating culturally and linguistically diverse or CLD students has always been a challenge for us SLPs. When I assumed the role of the department chair or what is now called lead SLP, I was determined to address this problem. The IDEA states that testing and assessment materials and procedures used for the purposes of assessment and placement of individuals with exceptional needs are selected and administered so as not to be racially or culturally discriminatory. The California Ed Code added the word sexually in the law. The California Ed Code also includes the words assessment materials separate from testing. IDEA only talks about evaluation and assessment materials, and it never mentions tests, but each has to be selected and administered so as not to be racially, culturally, or sexually discriminatory. What drives SLPs to lean on standardized tests when assessing CLD students? One is lack of SLPs who are proficient in a language other than English. 
as you saw in our um, demographics, our district only has two Spanish speaking SLPs. Number two is lack of training. Some graduate programs did not include multicultural issues. Number three, standardized tests seem to be easy to use and give us numbers and we SLPs love norms. Norms, however, may lead to incorrect diagnoses. Number four, the California Ed Code has specific criteria for a language disorder, but we do not always have to use percentile ranks. It's worth noting that the law allows for alternative means. Using inappropriate assessment materials lead to biased results. Now, here's the, um, the California Ed Code eligibility criteria. Um, we have articulation disorder, um, voice and fluency, and there are no numbers or standard scores required or um, stated in the law. However, for language, there are numbers that are written in the law and we SLPs tend to read just the first part of it. So here the pupil scores at least 1.5 standard deviations below the mean or below the seventh percentile for his or her chronological age or developmental level on two or more standardized tests in one or more of the following areas of language development, morphology, syntax, semantics, or pragmatics. There is the second part of the law, however, which um, most of us tend to forget. When standardized tests are considered to be invalid for the specific pupil, the expected language performance, performance level should be determined by alternative means as specified on the assessment plan. We have to be careful about choosing assessment materials because the biases in the assessment materials may inappropriately identify students with speech or language disorder. The law provides for alternative means, which would be more appropriate for students who speak varieties of English other than mainstream American English, who are going through second language learning, or who come from low socioeconomic backgrounds. There's also um, the second part of that law, which includes a score and a language sample. Here again, we see that alternative means should be considered when standard, um, standardized tests are considered invalid. In our district, we continue to grapple with challenges in assessing CLD students. To affect changes, we have done and continue to implement the following. What have we done to bring about change? One is to talk about it. We recognize that there is a big problem about the way we are assessing our CLD students. Um, um, in our monthly meetings, I include one or two concepts or ideas about testing our CLD students. And we have been discussing dynamic assessments. Our monthly meetings serve as a venue for discussions about difficult topics and testing our CLD students has been an area that has been identified as an area of interest as well as difficulty. I'm seeing more SLPs being open to alternative ways of assessing CLD students. Number two, provide consultation and supportive meetings. I work with our bilingual SLPs and we provide consultation to our colleagues about what assessment materials or procedures to use with CLD students. I have created a space where SLPs can freely ask questions and discuss questions about testing these students. One of the blessings of the pandemic was that I was able to hold weekly supportive meetings so that SLPs can connect with each other on Zoom and discuss difficult cases. The meetings were intended to be productive conversations about testing or difficult to test students, most of whom were CLD students. Number three, provide alternative assessment materials that CLD can access and use with their CLD students. I have created a department padlet that SLPs can access. I will show you a screenshot later of what, how that looks like. It has links to resources such as Leaders Project, 
www.slamcards.org where SLPs can access SLAM cards, non-word repetition tests, and other wonderful resources. Our new SELPA director has recently approved my request for a complete set of SLAM cards for all SLPs. When I share this news at our department meeting, those who have not used the SLAM cards express willingness to try them. And I'm also a member of a collaborative where we can request materials. And this is a great way to obtain assessment materials that would be more appropriate for our CLD students. Here's um, our Padlet. So you can see we have assessment resources right here where you can see the um, um, SLAM cards. And then we have our template. We have bilingual resources as well. And um, we have our interview forms, the critical questions for parents and teachers and non-word repetition task um, demonstration. We also have our all our department forms. Um, RTI is one of them, our RTI form. Number four, hire more bilingual SLPs who are knowledgeable about evaluating CLD students. I go to job fairs with our um, SELPA director to recruit SLPs. I also conduct interviews. Our interviews include questions about assessments for or with CLD students so that we can gauge the candidates' knowledge and skills about assessment with this population. Number five, incentivize bilingual SLPs by providing them a bilingual stipend. We have the bilingual stipend written into our contract. We make sure to include it every time our contract is renegotiated. This is a great way to attract bilingual SLPs and motivate monolingual SLPs to learn the language that's being used by their students. Number six, regularly provide professional development or PD activities on testing CLD students. I lead my department in planning our trainings for the school year. We identify our needs and vote on the topics. We get a budget for our trainings from our Medical Collaborative. And this collaborative makes decisions about how to spend funds that we receive from our billing. One of um, the accomplishments that I'm very proud of is um, being um, our department is a California board accredited PD provider. We are able to host high quality PD activities. We have had the privilege of having Dr. Kate Crowley and Dr. Elizabeth Pena as our speakers. And I will continue to invite leaders in the field to equip us with knowledge and skills in assessing our CLD students. Here was, um, here's a screenshot of when Dr. Pena spoke to us. Number seven, encourage use of alternative, quality, qualitative, and dynamic assessments. SLPs usually ask my opinions about their assessments, and I serve as their extra pair of eyes. I encourage my colleagues to use dynamic assessments and other alternative means for assessments. I encourage them to not depend on standardized tests, which can yield inaccurate diagnoses. Number eight, direct SLPs to appropriate resources. I direct them to appropriate sites or resources where they can learn more about CLD students. I share with them research articles and trainings that they can attend. And we have some energetic SLPs who take the opportunity to learn more about our CLD populations. I also encourage other SLPs to share good information that they have stumbled upon. And we discuss that during our monthly meetings. Number nine, involve the special ed administrators and program specialists. Administrators and program specialists look for standardized scores or percentile ranks when an evaluation report is being challenged by parents and advocates. I talk to them about dynamic assessments and other appropriate assessment materials that do not yield standardized scores. So far, they have been pretty receptive. We have a lot of work to do in effecting changes in the way we assess our CLD students. We are gaining traction. I'm seeing more and more SLPs use language samples, slam cards, non-word repetition tests, and dynamic assessments. I'm seeing positive changes. SLPs are reporting that they're gaining insights on bilingual assessments and putting them to good use. A good number of our SLPs are using the slam cards. One SLP stated, I can get a wealth of information from the SLAM cards than when I use a standardized test, which takes a lot of time. 
I would like to close with a quote from Socrates. The secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. It will probably take us a few more years to grasp, fully grasp how to appropriately test CLG students. But I am optimistic that with the small changes that we have been implementing, we will get there. Hello, my name is Tara Bailey. I am Senior Manager of Related Service Providers for Chicago Public Schools in the Office of Diverse Learner Supports and Services. And I am Giselle Nunez. I am an Assistant Professor in the Communication Sciences and Disorders Program in St. Xavier University in Chicago. One of the things that I noticed as a manager at the time of the Speech Language Pathologist for Chicago Public Schools was that many of our speech language pathologists, our bilingual speech language pathologists um, said that they were felt that they were not equipped to work with bilingual students for Chicago public schools who were enrolled in Chicago public schools. So we had 340 students. Of those 340 students in 2020, 63,000 of them, uh, close to 19% of them um, were bilingual and spoke 110 languages. 14% of them had IEPs and 49% of them were Hispanic. And so in 2020, 6% of our SLPs were bilingual. And those bilingual SLPs expressed oftentimes that they did not feel 100% equipped to work with our students. So based on the relationship that I had with Giselle um, and based on her expertise, I reached out to her to ask if she could, if we could facilitate some discussions with our SLPs and, and facilitate a way to equip them to feel better equipped um, or facilitate a discussion to, so that they felt better equipped uh, to work with the students of CPS. And so this is how we came upon um, the pilot study that we then developed. I know um, that the voices of bilingual SLPs are ones that tend to be disregarded or just not heard as loud. So I came in with um, already my bias of I know there's a need. However, um, I also came in with, let's get these voices heard. So um, we were able to, um, I was able to come in and actually use what the district has used before, which is this PLC model. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But more than anything, what um, I wanted to come into the study was what do the schools and the districts, what are the supports that they need to provide the services? And after engaging in this PLC model, how do they perceive um, this in their practice? So what was beautiful about this was that um, we were able to um, ask all the SLPs um, in, you know, who's interested in this. Um, and we were able to do this remotely because this was during COVID. So what we did is we had this PLC model. So we had all the SLPs, um, work in a group and they were engaging and collaborating with each other and they were able to we were really able to hone in on specific areas of need so with the bilingual slps um we were able to talk about their practices what are you know we were able to bring in um, specific topics um, and they were just in one group in the literature um professional learning communities have been used um, to address you know things like response to intervention or inter evidence-based intervention strategies so we already had the support and the research and evidence-based practice behind using this specific model um and so we had 23 bilingual slps um, engage in this um, pilot study and uh, they were able to um, meet in this professional learning community within five months um the, throughout five months of um, the pandemic. So um, what was nice about this is we were able to engage in group discussions, we were able to engage in breakout activities, and the SLPs were able to tell us what their areas of need were. Um, and then following each of these meetings, we had them complete exit slips. And these exit slips ask questions like, what went well? What are some areas of need? And again, all we were able to do is take this information and um, you know, be able to help, um, you know, not fix necessarily, but help inform the next topic and then also gather final impressions. Um, and I will say that um, being able to work with Tara so closely and being able to um, get the feedback from the bilingual SLPs, it just felt like a very natural way of looking at research. Um, 
it, we know that what's so important is that as me, myself, um, I cannot come in um, from the university telling the bilingual SLPs what they need to know um, and how to do things because they are out on the field. Um, and I have been in these shoes. I have been a clinician. So um, being able to respect and help guide um, what the district is doing and to support it using best evidence practice, but also telling the district, hey, this, this is what's going on with SLPs. This is why they're feeling burnt out. Um, was really, um, you know, that two-way um, respect avenue that we needed to have a better understanding. Um, so the findings suggested that um, the SLPs benefited from this model, um, and they talked about a positive experience um, and, of course, the challenges. So they felt respected, they felt heard, um, but in um, being able to um, engage with each other. And then they felt that some of the challenges, of course, came from being online in a pandemic, not being able to be hands-on with some of the material. Um, but the most important thing that came out of this were the outcomes. Um, and I'm gonna have Tara to talk about those. I should add, just to add to some of the things that um, Giselle just spoke about, that I was not present during the pilot study and the meetings that she had with them so that they could really disclose their feelings about um, their practices and what they needed from us um, in, in the future. And so I think that we were able to get a lot of good information about how to move forward um, with the information because I think that they were really um, forthcoming with what their, their needs were. And so some of the things that we were able to do as a result of the study is to increase our collaboration with the Office of Language and Cultural Education, which we call OSE for short. Um, and they were able to really inform our practice moving forward, too. Um, I'll kind of skip ahead a little bit because they were able to really talk to us about how our practice was a little flawed in some ways. We, in the past, when we did bilingual from a citywide perspective, when we did bilingual assessment, we would um, not always do our initial evaluations in the home language of the students. And so we were able to shift our practice to do that. So we revised our citywide assessment practices to include um, the initial evaluation in the home language of the students. So as a result of this practice or the, the um, results of the study, we increased our collaboration with OSE and, and revised our citywide assessment practice. We also, as a result, had we increased our university partnerships. We have a longstanding relationship Previously with um, St. Xavier University, we previously had a relationship with them, but I think that our relationship as a result of this particular study has increased exponen exponentially um, with St. Xavier because we now, um, with Dr. Nunez, we now have that relationship. We're going to continue to um, do things as it relates to bilingual studies, but also um, expand that um, and, and work with other universities to increase our bilingual practices. Um, we've established ongoing professional development for bilingual SLPs, bilingual psychologists within the district, bilingual social workers within the district as a result. We are also providing bilingual training for all related service providers as a result of this particular study. In addition, we were able to um, offer bilingual the bilingual endorsement program for bilingual RSPs. And so now we are able to ensure that those who are interested can now get the bilingual endorsement um, free of cost. They don't have to pay for it. We are now providing um, that program for them. So we are hoping that in the future, um, any bilingual uh, RSP who is interested in getting that endorsement will do so and therefore be better pre prepared to um, diagnose um, uh, students and, and provide interventions for students as needed. And finally, we um, now we can say that we wrote a grant, but also had the grant accepted to provide training on dynamic assessment for all SLPs to appropriately assess CLD students throughout the district. And so we did a lot as a result of this particular pilot study, and we are super excited that we're going to be able to um, pretty much stand on the, the results um, for years to come, because we know that this is going to be the gift that keeps on giving. So what's next? As I just mentioned, um, we plan to do the uh, use, utilize the multicultural grant to train all SLPs. And so what we know is that what 
the practices that are utilized for bilingual students are also good practices for all students, right? Not just students that are um, bilingual, but students who um, are often misdiagnosed. Those same practices can be utilized for those students. So we're hoping to get our SOPs who are working with um, students throughout the city can also be utilizing those specific skills so that they can move forward um, so that we can not just um, lessen the, the diagnoses for students, but also appropriately diagnose students throughout the district. Um, we wanna cont continue to be agents of change throughout the district. And hopefully we know that this training will be specific to our current SLPs. We hope that we, they will continue to pass along the word so that it, any new hires that we have that come into the district, that our current SLPs will be able to pass along that information so that we can continue the tradition of this information that we've learned. Um, so we want to continue that cycle of learning. And so we are excited about this um, information that we've been able to provide, these trainings that we're going to be able to provide our SLPs and all RSPs moving forward. We know that um, we've had this ethical dilemma of being in, in this history of not necessarily providing the most appropriate diagnoses to students and not necessarily providing the, um, the right, doing right by our bilingual students. And so we want to move forward in the, um, in, in the, in the ethical, uh, most ethical way possible for our students. And so that's what we're excited about. And that's what's next for, for our district moving forward. Yes, and I just wanna add that um, as a um, university um, coming into a district that has, um, you know, just historically um, just a huge district and has a lot of needs and a lot of um, populations um, that are, you know, we have to constantly just, you know, it's not just the bilingual, it's the low incidence population. It's, there's a lot going on. Um, I will say that it was such a pleasure um, and it was really neat. Um, I really want to hone in on the agent of change. Um, I think one of the um, impacts of being able to come in is to challenge the status quo and being able to ensure that we are doing what is best for the children, um, best for the students, best for the communities um, in this district. And change is hard, change is hard for everyone. Um, and I will say that um, Tara made this, you know, just brought it in <laughs> and was able to, um, you know, the SLPs, the bilingual SLPs knew that they needed to change their practices. And I think being able to tie um, administration, the, the SLPs on, um, you know, that are in the field and then the university piece. So like, hey, let's look at um, what we can do to bring this positive change to the district was really a wonderful experience. So thank you all. Um, we do want to um, point out that um, this article is available um, and, um, the journal, so um, we will um, have the citation um, available for, for you. Um, and we look forward to getting our next publication out um, when we brought the dynamic assessments to um, the schools and just training the entire district because that was also a unique experience as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.